So let me hide these. Okay. Uh, so good morning and happy Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, today we will introduce new material at a high level because I understand. I know that we, I understand rather, given that there is an exam this Wednesday, it's not always the best idea to introduce a new module uh, the class period before. So this is purposefully kept for the first half of today at a high level to motivate issues concerning time. And then on Friday, after the exam, um, the class meeting on Friday, uh, we will continue on with some of the time-based APIs uh, in Pandas, uh, in particular, uh, the series time-based APIs. And so time is quite important. Um, and today I'm not going to do any uh, recap of the Jeopardy game from last time. Um, there's something I'm forgetting. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, yes. And I'll be spending the second half of today um, going over solutions to the homework to put you in the mind space of how to answer these types of questions. Um, project number two, I'm almost done uh, submitting them. Two of you have already uh, seen your scores from project two. The rest I will submit uh, throughout the course of today in through tonight. And the graded homework, that's probably going to get to you uh, sometime maybe on Saturday or so, depending on my schedule. Uh, but before we begin, um, some usual administrative bits. Of course, uh, written exam number one uh, is out, will be out rather, on Wednesday, the 1st of March. It'll auto-release, um, well, not really at nine, just before class starts, like five minutes before. And it will, um, submission site will go away 24 hours after that. Again, the format is 24 hour format. It won't take you 24 hours to set the exam. Um, it's scoped to about an hour and 15 minutes, which is one class period, plus or minus, depending on how you choose to prepare. It is open book and open notes. Uh, I ask thought types of questions. I don't expect you to memorize things. I think that is not very useful uh, to your education. And so this is to be an individual effort please treat it like a regular or traditional uh, exam. And with great privilege comes great responsibility. And so because of that, I'm requiring everyone to sign an honesty statement, which is to be included with your exam submission. And so this is open book, open notes, but closed human being. Uh, that means uh, the TAs are not to help you on this. You're not to collaborate on this with uh, colleagues in the class, or anyone else. And the reason for this uh, actually kind of goes back to when we had COVID shut down, when I was at my previous institution, I found for this type of class, this format works really well for the types of questions um, that are meaningful uh, for this type of material. And so it also is conducive for you to choose the time in the venue that is most conducive to your success. And if anyone uh, requires accommodation, I haven't yet received any accommodation letters, but certainly it is your right uh, to request that uh, through uh, the accessibility office uh, to initiate their process, which results in formal letters going to each one of your faculty. Uh, this format does satisfy the requirements for accommodation. Um, and if there are any questions about that, uh, please do not hesitate uh, to reach out to me. Um, I value your privacy. Actually, I take privacy very seriously. Um, and so I won't discuss it in front of, the, uh, in front of other people. Um, and I will certainly uh, keep all conversations about that uh, between you and, and me. Okay, any questions about this? No, no questions. It's just Monday morning. Yeah, all right, I hear you. Uh, and so the exam, will cover all material, including Wednesday, the 25th uh, class. So it will include uh, items on data frames. And uh, someone asked me, I can't remember who it was, if I could put up a study guide, I put that up, a bulleted list of all the topics that are fair game. It doesn't mean that all those topics will be on the exam. Uh, goodness, no. Uh, it just means uh, material uh, that we've covered listed there um, is fair game uh, for questions. Okay. Any questions about that? No? All right. And so, um, oh, yeah. This, I was woken up at four o'clock by this dog um, because she thought that she should tell me that there's something running around in the yard at 4 a.m. Uh, so if there's things I forget, 
uh, please don't hesitate to ask for clarification. Uh, you know, it kind of gets you right in that best part of sleep, right? The REM sleep. So, um, so yeah, I, I understand how you feel with some of you. All right. So time. Now, of course, I played um, in a jazz band uh, back in the day. And so I'm into music. Um, let me see. Question. Oh, I played bass guitar in the jazz band. Yeah. yeah. We used to play on Boston City Hall Plaza. It was just awesome. But, you know, so, uh, but yeah, this is um, Time is on My Side by Irma Thomas. I like the Motown era, have like the whole box set. Right? But anyways, time. So what's the deal with time? Time is a really important medium. And we all sort of viscerally have an understanding of what time is. Certainly doesn't proceed backwards. It moves forward. And certainly theoretical physicists, um, as we speak, are trying uh, to unlock uh, some of the mysteries about time and how it proceeds and why it proceeds the way it does in the universe. But in these pictures, I've listed um, some pictures from so-called strobe photography. And with strobe photography, you have a high-speed strobe light and high-speed uh, camera, and you capture so-called snapshots in time. And this idea of capturing snapshots in time are immensely useful for understanding the behavior or the so-called dynamics of a particular system under study. And in this framework of random variables that we talked about, um, this function over raw observations, you can think of that as a method for representing mathematically this idea of measurements or snapshots in time. And so here we have a dart um, piercing a balloon, and you can see how the balloon uh, explodes or ruptures. And then on the right-hand side, your right, we have a cat, uh, and this cat was dropped from some height. And you can see how the cat rights itself uh, midair, shifting its momentum and its mass uh, so that it always uh, lands on its feet. And so this idea of time is really important, but more particularly, there's a theory called Talkin's theorem. And what this Talkin's theorem alludes to is that through a window of so-called observations, um, and it doesn't matter if that window is over a long span of time or over a short span of time, but through this window of observations, you can uncover uh, the so-called hidden states of some dynamical system, where dynamical system is a framework for how you talk about observations or systems rather uh, that proceed or change their configuration in time for some loose definition of configuration. And so to illustrate this importance, here I have a typical swing and this swing has a mass. And if you pull it to one side and you let it go, it's gonna start out with zero velocity and it's gonna start to accelerate as it goes from the first extreme, let's assume on the left-hand side, um, and it's gonna accelerate until it gets to the bottom. And at the bottom, it's gonna have its largest velocity when it's in that position. And then as it goes to the other extreme on the right, uh, gravity is gonna take over and it's gonna decelerate, it's gonna slow down. And it's gonna slow down until it reaches a high point on the right-hand side. And at that high point, the velocity is gonna be zero, and then it's gonna get negative going the other direction. So it's gonna swing back and forth. So let's imagine if you did not see the swing and you have sort of a na native sense or visceral sense of how a swing works um, through what's called naive physics, uh, which you um, learn as children, young children, as you interact with the world. But just, Let's imagine if you had only two measurements from this system, and you can think of these as random variables, um, position um, and uh, velocity over time. And so here at the inset <clears throat> on the left-hand side, your left, um, if we only had these two measurements over time, we're taking measurements of position. And so the position here in X, it's gonna get more and more positive. It's gonna go in this direction. Um, in Y, it's gonna get more and more negative till it reaches this bottom. And then it's gonna transition, continue to get more positive in X, and then start to go positive in Y. 
And then conversely, once it hits the extreme on the right-hand side, it's X is gonna get more and more negative and Y is gonna get negative. And so over time, if you only measured, say the position, okay, well, you have a position and let's just imagine we're only looking at the X axis. This position is gonna start out um, very negative. And that position over time is gonna get more positive. And then it's gonna go, um, let's see, I'm sorry, go more positive, more positive, more positive, and then start getting more negative. Likewise, with the velocity, we're gonna start with some positive velocity. And that velocity is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller till uh, it reaches, oops, I'm sorry. Huh. Oh, this four o'clock thing. The velocity is gonna start out at zero and it's gonna get more and more positive. It's gonna reach a maximum at this point in the center. And then it's gonna get more and more and more negative. And then it's gonna reach zero and continue. And so when you look at the temporal behavior without knowing anything about the swing, just by taking measurements at regular intervals of these two variables, the position and the velocity, you see a repeatable pattern occur. And this repeating, repeatable pattern um, co-occurs in position and in velocity. And just by looking at windows of observation, you can recover these positions and give them names purely from the data. And you could call this the left extreme. You might call this the bottom. And you might call this the right extreme. And so this idea of being able to make observations over time in some span of time or over some span of time is a really important analytical tool uh, for arbitrary data. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to get across. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. And so another um, quantity that's very much a consumer of time-based analysis pertains to financial markets. Now, of course, this isn't a class in finance. And so I'll give a little bit of background and then give you a flavor of the types of time-based analyses uh, that people use for financial instruments. And so it all begins uh, with the market and the financial market consists of a set of so-called instruments or products that you either buy or sell directly or you buy so-called derivatives um, things indirectly uh, for these various instruments comprising uh, the financial market. And so these instruments fall into three major categories and absolutely there are variations of this, uh, so-called stocks, uh, bonds, and commodities, okay? And so let's begin with stocks. Uh, suppose you have a company, right? And if the company is publicly traded, uh, an arbitrary person uh, can buy uh, these stocks. If a company is not publicly traded, there are certainly private capital markets, private equity uh, that buy and sell parts of companies. But nonetheless, a stock represents the fractional ownership of a company. Suppose if you have some company and that company has a certain amount of revenue it collects based on that revenue and the assets like the factories and buildings and things like that the company owns, that company has a value. And so in order to raise money, a company sells fractional amounts of its value. Let's say, you know, they want to build a new factory or they want to expand overseas. And each one of these fractional pieces, and they usually come up with a specific amount like 10 million shares. Each one of these shares represents an equal proportion of the total value of this company. So suppose you brought or you purchased three of these fractional shares you're going to pay a cost of three times this proportion of the value uh, divided by the total number of shares. Now, if the company then has a great year, let's say it's COVID and it's a computer company, and before in a household, typically you'd have one computer in the household, now each individual had his or her own computer, of course, that company's output is gonna increase because they're selling more computers, they're selling more product. And if the output increases and the revenue or the money collected increases, then the value of that stock goes up because that company is more productive, right? The total amount of money associated with it has increased 
but that proportion, the number of shares has remained fixed. So the price of that share goes up. So when the company grows, your fractional piece, your individual share or security, it also increases in value. And if you decide to go and sell it, you then pocket or profit um, the amount uh, of the difference between that increased value at which you sold it and hopefully that smaller value at which you purchased it. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? And I don't assume you're in the business school. Another uh, type of instrument uh, financially is a so-called bond. And a bond is a mechanism that allows uh, corporate entities, typically also municipalities, uh, to take on debt. Um, for example, I think it was two years ago, uh, Clark took out a $100 million loan or bond in order to rework its finances because money was cheap at the time. Rates were relatively or historically small. And so um, organizations, be they universities, companies, uh, municipalities, um, they put out bonds. And what that bond represents is a loan. And that loan is chopped up into pieces, that debt, and a fractional piece of that loan is sold as a quote unquote bond. Okay. Any questions? And so a bond, it represents a promise by some borrower to repay principal plus interest for that fractional piece of that debt uh, that you're purchasing. Okay. Now, of course, the rate that you get for your bond, that interest is dependent on the financial health of that particular organization. And there are companies uh, like Moody's and Dun & Bradstreet uh, that are constantly um, um, evaluating and scoring organizations on their credit worthiness. Okay. And so municipalities um, put out bonds uh, because they need to borrow money, and that might be uh, to implement services, uh, to buy up land, uh, to run uh, governments, and to implement programs. And these municipalities also are evaluated on their credit worthiness. And so-called federal bonds, the federal government borrows money all the time, both from citizens here, as well as citizens from around or people from around the world in other countries. And these so-called federal bonds are generally exempt uh, from state and local well, federal taxes, sometimes state taxes. They're so appreciative of the fact that uh, you're um, buying their debt that any interest uh, that you earn on it, uh, they exempt that from federal tax returns. And so a bond is similar to a stock, but a bond uh, represents fractional debt uh, that some organization, uh, be that a company or a government uh, has taken out. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Yeah. And then lastly, um, there's a commodity. And a commodity represents a raw material and this raw material can either be consumed directly in its unadulterated form, or it can be refined and integrated into some other product. Some examples of commodities are agricultural products like soy and corn, uh, gold, um, and it's not just for uh, things like jewelry, it's used for electronics and all sorts of other purposes as well as oil, and oil is immensely useful. It's used for gasoline, of course, that's a big one, heating oil, but derivatives from oil, uh, petroleum is used for plastics, it's used for medicines, it's used for all sorts of purposes, uh, the so-called derivatives uh, from oil. And so you take this raw material and you can either directly purchase um, batches of output of these commodities, or you can purchase them indirectly by pooling your purchase with others uh, in the form of something that looks like a stock, a so-called futures contract. And you can buy and sell these on so-called mercantile exchanges. And what it does is it gives you the ownership of something, a batch, like a thousand head of cattle, uh, for example, and you can then either buy it, sell it, or if you choose to, and you have a place to put them, you can decide, give me my thousand head of cattle. Now, this is if you've ever participated in something called a farm share or so-called community supported agriculture, this is a commodities market on a local scale. But the commodity market that I refer to, um, it's on a national and international scale. Okay, any questions? No? All right. And so you might ask, why would someone ever invest 
buy rain checks, so to speak, uh, for these commodities is because it's a great hedge against inflation. Supply and demand says if there's less of the commodity uh, for whatever reason, the price goes up. Certainly, if it's something like a staple commodity like soy or corn, um, the cost of goods, uh, of goods goes up and that can contribute to inflation. Now, of course, inflation means you have too many dollars chasing too few goods and services, but for the average person, salaries don't go up, so the cost of living increases uh, tremendously. And so if you have commodities in your investment portfolio, these commodities also rise very quickly with the cost of inflation. So people often invest in commodities as a way to try to protect their investment against inflation by having a component of it that rises quickly along with inflation. Okay, any questions? That makes sense? Yeah, all right. And so the commodities trades or commodities prices are impacted by supply and demand, but it's also impacted by geopolitics. So if you're ever considering or thinking about um, getting into the commodities market or trading, it's really important to understand the geopolitics wrapped up uh, in these commodities. And there are lots of very interesting interactions. And so why do we care about this concerning time? And people are very interested in financial markets, understanding the time-based behavior. You want to know if the market is going to rise or expected to rise, a so-called bull market as it's uh, coined, the term is coined, if it's expected to fall, a so-called bear market, or if it's going to be neutral, is the price of some set of financial instruments are they going to kind of bounce up and down a little bit, a little bit of standard deviation, a little variance, um, but it stays relatively even over time. And so people are immensely um, concerned uh, with financial data, in particular, how it behaves over time. And this time can be on a scale of a day, a week, a month, a few minutes, a year, a quarter, uh, what have you. Okay. And so this is a chart from Yahoo Finance, and we see in the blue, this particular chart is for a share of Apple stock. It's not current, this particular span of time, but this represents the closing price over one month uh, for Apple stock. Now in this visualization, we have a line chart in the blue, and that represents the closing price or the price at the end of the trading day, which is a weekday, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m on non-federal uh, holidays, regular business days. And along the bottom, we have what are called volume underlays. And we talked about this share that you can buy. The volume is a count of all of the share purchases that's in the green and the number of share uh, sales that's in the red. So one of the things you can see about this graph is that you'll notice the share price goes up coincident with a green bar meaning that you had more purchases of the share than you had sales. And you can see this um, blue graph, the um, closing price goes down consistent with a day where you had a red bar in the volume underlay, namely the number of sales um, was larger than the number of purchases. And so supply and demand says if more people want it or trying to buy, the price goes up. If fewer people want it, more selling, a red a volume underlay bar, uh, then the price goes down. And so with this, this idea of time is so important that in various trading regimes, uh, they look for characteristic shapes uh, over time uh, in these share price uh, windows. And so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but one interesting one is called the cup and handle, right? It kind of looks like a teacup with a little handle on the end. And so much so is this temporal behavior, these snapshots in time over the course of weeks, months, quarter, what have you, that they give names to these characteristic shapes. And when they recognize these shapes as proceeding, they recognize them actively, and then they make trading decisions, sometimes automate those trading decisions. So you have high frequency trading uh, triggered by computer. Any questions? No? All right. And so this idea of time-based analysis is particularly important in the finance industry as it pertains to financial instruments trying to discern whether a market is going to increase, uh, decrease, or remain steady over time. Okay. And so 
Consumer behavior is another important set of considerations for analysis for temporal behavior. And you can imagine a coffee shop. In this particular uh, video, we have an overhead camera instrumenting the entryway. Let's see if I can get the pen to stop. Nope. There we go. So we have an overhead camera uh, instrumenting or watching the entryway, or you could call it the entry box of a retail concern. And it's tracking all of the people uh, that either go from outside the store to inside the store or inside the store to outside the store. Now I'll direct your attention uh, to the upper right-hand corner, uh, your right of the video. It maintains a count of the number of people that leave the store uh, as well as the number of people that enter the store. The difference between the two is certainly the number of people that are inside of the store. And so with your point of sale systems, your computerized point of sale systems in the retail establishment, you can look at the number of people in the store um, over time. It could be every minute, every five minutes, every hour, what have you. Um, and you can look at how much revenue you're collecting, how many sales you're making um, per unit time, and look at the number of people in the store. And so that sort of information is immensely useful because now you can, from your data, determine the so-called seasonality of your shop. Thinking of something like a coffee shop, and there's a morning rush, uh, there's a lunch rush, and there's an afternoon rush. Certainly that changes over the course of the year. Uh, and likewise, the product that you're selling different points of the year is also going to change. And so armed with all of this data, you can make analyses. And then you take these analyses and you try to mimic them using probability distributions that are stylized. And now that you have these probability distributions that are stylized, you take all of your observations, this customer count over time, and now you can ask that probability, um, how many customers should I have at this point in time? Now, it's not just a wild guess, it's based on the data that you observe um, over some period of time. And so this is inference, and you take uh, a method, which we'll talk about max likelihood estimation, to find a reasonable replacement for the parameters of this guess about how this data behaves, your modeling distribution. And then you can ask it questions and do all sorts of things, including forecasting, where you're just saying, assuming this model is true, and these customers that you simulate as arriving to the store, if you know the average sales of the various products, now you can run that simulation and decide I need this much of this product or I'm gonna have this much revenue and let that dictate how many, for example, employees you're gonna hire over certain shifts during the day. And so in this case, time is very, very important. And there are models that we can use uh, to describe how this data behaves, the aboutness, these vector instantiations over periods of time. Okay, any questions about this? No? All right. So that's one thing that we'll be doing at one point during the semester. Another one concerns so-called quantified self, and quantified self talks about um, a patient um, taking a very active role in his or her health. Uh, my wife works in a hospital, and so I had to ask her about this. A so-called halter monitor uh, is something that's worn over the span of days or weeks, and it's used uh, to measure uh, your heart rhythm. And so heart rhythm abnormalities uh, can be fatal, and it's called arterial fibrillation, and it could cause pooling of the blood, which causes blood clots to form uh, that can break off and travel to all sorts of parts of the body. And so this is an example of a halter monitor. And down below, I have um, a plot of the data, I forgot what it's called, um, measured from a halter monitor. So essentially what you do is you take temporal measurements and many measurements over some window of time. It could be 10 a second, it could be five a second, it could be three a second over some span of time. And you compute an average to have a representation of what this heart rhythm looks like uh, per unit time. So now we take the average of the averages, the expectation and the variance, the variance called the standard error, and now we can use the relationship uh, between uh, the percentage of probability mass 
um, and standard deviation uh, to effectively do outlier detection. And what you're looking for there, you can do it for a single patient or across a cohort of patients. Um, what you're doing is you're continually looking for instances of heart uh, rhythms that you measure. Are they typical of what a heart rhythm should be? Now, if you aggregate data across a cohort, let's say um, 16 uh, to 25 year olds, you can do it cohort based, but you can also do this data driven approach or, um, or exercises data driven approach for an individual. And now with that, you can score in time, okay, at this point in time, there was an abnormal um, heart rhythm. And now you can do some learning and more proactive interventions um, with someone's health status. Okay, any questions about this? No? And so algorithmically here, we have in the red, you loop some number of times and you take N many samples. And if you increase the sample size, anything you say uh, about this average gets closer and closer and closer to the unknown true average. Okay. And so there are ways of doing this that we'll talk about this idea of outlier detection uh, through a so-called standard normal distribution. Uh, the process of normalization. And we'll talk about that with confidence intervals as well as outlier detection. Um, and we'll get to that maybe at the two thirds, maybe halfway point in the semester. Okay, any questions? No? And so this last one is one that I'm sort of pivoting my research towards. Um, the UN says the population will be um, rapidly expanding and this will put tremendous pressure on food systems demand is gonna increase significantly. And certainly uh, there have been many efforts um, on the biologic side, on the seed development, as well as nutrient measurement uh, for improving both the yield and the quality of agricultural products. And so certainly at this university, uh, the geography department uh, does analysis of land mass and farms on a macro scale uh, using satellite imagery. Um, but one of the things where this is going is to increase specificity, um, ultimately driving down to a plant level, right? And so we're concerned about pest management, about soil quality, disease management, generally plant health and weather changes. And the idea is then if you can increase specificity um, down to the plant level, when you apply interventions, be that pesticides or you know, uh, nutrients and things like that, uh, you can save on the amount that you're applying uh, by localizing. You only place these things in the regions where they're required and not blanketing an entire field with them. And so a lot of research in farm management um, is going towards implementing um, internet of things or localized sensors uh, in regular grids uh, throughout uh, fields. And these things measure typical things like wind speed, temperature, humidity, but there are other sensors uh, that measure um, various nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus um, in uh, the soil itself. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? No? All right. And so this is a view of a field uh, that's been instrumented with sensor nodes. And these things generally wirelessly use the cell phone uh, network uh, to beam this data samples of various um, factors uh, that are taken in regular increments uh, throughout time. Now, Basically, you instrument your crops. Um, and for this class, our concern is the data and the analyses you do on that data. Because the growing season is uh, very small, it's during the temperate uh, parts, especially in regions like in the US where we have cold winters uh, for at least two thirds of upper two thirds of the country, um, you really want to make sure you understand what's going on locally um, in your crops. And so for this class, we're concerned about our data and ultimately um, the processing that we do, the methods are certainly indexed in time and you need to make a decision applying some intervention. And what this instrumentation affords you is the ability um, more rapidly uh, to make agile decisions being 
that once you apply your intervention, you apply some nutrients somewhere in your field, um, in about a week or so, you're seeing the result of that intervention. And so this is really important for increasing yield and increasing quality, and it's where farm management uh, is certainly going. And so things like heat uh, are very important because heat can impact all sorts of things uh, impacting the quality and yield uh, for your agricultural products. It can reduce photosynthesis, the ability for a plant to feed itself. It can also reduce the activity by the pollinators, the bees, um, because if it's too hot, um, they're not going to act as uh, actively. And bees are responsible uh, for uh, spreading pollen uh, for lots and lots of agricultural products. In fact, um, back in Delaware, where I came from, you'll see these farms, they rent these beehives, these mobile beehives, and they'll flop them down there in the spring uh, to go forth and pollinate the fields uh, to increase the yield for fruits and certain vegetables. And so if you have too much heat, you can get uh, heat stress and that impacts uh, the shoot development uh, for your plants. And it can also accelerate your water evaporation uh, and you're gonna be spending more in your water costs, which can be very significant uh, for an agricultural operation. Wind speed is also very important because if the wind is too strong, it'll certainly tear uh, your leaves and reduce photosynthesis. Um, if the wind is just right, that's actually very good for plants because it can make your plants uh, more robust because they're trying to act against that mild wind. And so here is a depiction of these two measurements. And you can imagine we're measuring temperature at one rate, which is often the case in many real sensors. Um, you have measurement at temperature, say, every 10 minutes and wind, wind speed, for example, every 15 minutes. So registered in time, uh, when we look at data up to this point, we considered uh, what we called vector instantiations um, of all of the measurements. And that assumed incorrectly uh, that all of the measurements were available at the same time. And so in this case, there are instances where you have a temperature measurement that's current and available, but at that time, because the wind speed is every 15 minutes, you don't have a current wind speed. And so another important concept um, is probabilistic um, interpret interpolation, uh, where you can make a distribution or probabilistic assumption about the measurements from a sensor. And then when you don't have a measurement, you ask your probabilistic simulation. And then when you do have a measurement, you update what you know about that probability distribution. And so there's something called a Kalman filter or a Gaussian process, which is a really important construct in data science, especially because it allows you to fill in missing data in a very principled fashion. Okay, and we'll be talking about that as well towards the end of the semester. Okay, any questions? That makes sense? And so this idea of time is really, really important. Uh, we can use time and we can use modeling assumptions to effectively fuse together data or when we don't have data available at specific moments in time when we need to create a vector instantiation in order uh, to do analysis. Okay. And so that's all I had to say about time. And we have just over half of the period left. 